Hi uh, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Today we return to our best sci-fi Navy series where we compare a bunch of different factions and you, the voters, get to decide at the end of each video in our poll which faction you like the best. Today we'll be looking at the Galactic Empire. In our last video we covered the 10 flaws with their Navy. Today we're going to be looking at their 10 advantages. Probably one of the biggest advantages that the Galactic Emperor had was its incredibly fast FTL travel. Using a device known as a hyperdrive, ships are able to enter an alternate dimension known as hyperspace and travel across ridiculously long distances in extremely short time. Hello there. The Star Wars Galaxy is about the same size as the Milky Way Galaxy, and based on what we've seen in the movies, it takes about two or three weeks to cross the entire distance, depending on which hyperspace lanes you are using. In comparison, Star Trek Voyager estimated that it would take 70 years to cross the Milky Way Galaxy. So it doesn't really matter how advanced your ship's weapons and armor is if you arrive to the battle years after it's over. Fast hyperdrives allow the Galactic Empire to be extremely mobile and respond rapidly to threats across its systems with relative ease. Although it's not talked about much, the Star Wars Galaxy also has extremely advanced anti-gravity technology. The Empire's mastery of anti-gravity allows it to construct gigantic repulsors, which then allow for gigantic ships like the Imperial-class Star Destroyer to fly in atmosphere, which is a pretty incredible feat. But one of the most interesting gravity technologies that the Empire does have is the gravity well projector. These devices basically created a gravitational footprint that would pull nearby ships out of hyperspace and then prevent nearby ships from going into hyperspace. This is because every starship has a safety feature that pulls ships into real space when they detect a gravity well. This prevents a starship flying in hyperspace from crashing into a planetary body, a star, or maybe a fleet of enemy ships. Hyperspace is technically another dimension, but everything in the real world has its own counterpart in the hyperspace world as well. Used strategically by Imperial officers like Thrawn and the Interdictor could dictate when and where a battle was fought. It was also useful in ensnaring more mobile forces into a trap. Instead of pouring ridiculous amounts of resources into the Death Star, the Empire probably could have refitted a significant portion of its cruisers and Star Destroyers with this technology, making it incredibly difficult for the Rebel Alliance to continue escaping the Empire. This technology was so good it could have single-handedly ended the entire Galactic Civil War before it even really started. The Empire also has tractor beams on their ships, which in the hands of a creative captain can create some very interesting problems for the enemy. Tractor beams were basically focused gravitational energy beams that locked onto an object and reeled it in. Another interesting piece of technology that spawns out of the Empire's grasp of anti-gravity technology was the inertial compensator. This was another device that controlled how gravity worked on a ship. It created a bubble around the ship, decreasing drastically the G's on a pilot and the structure of the ship. This allowed Star Wars fighter pilots to survive maneuvers that would otherwise crush their bodies into a bloody sack. This inertial compensator, along with repulsors, allowed unwieldy craft like TIE fighters and X-Wings to be able to fly in a variety of different atmospheres, despite the fact that these ships have the aerodynamic profiles of a flying brick. More old school or perhaps daredevil pilots like Han Solo routinely dialed the inertial compensator down a few points so that they could have a better feel for how the ship is performing. This type of technology also allowed Star Wars ships to have gravity inside without any kind of rotating structure. While some of the space forces that we'll be talking about rely on kinetic energy weapons and also explosives, the majority of the Galactic Empire's firepower comes in the form of highly heated particle bolts fired out of turbo lasers. These were incredibly powerful thermal projectiles that could melt through multiple layers of bulkhead. And because they were powered by some kind of gas or fuel, each ship could carry a relatively large amount of ammunition. Now, in our last video, we talked about some of the drawbacks with the turbo laser. Um, it's basically just a line of sight weapon. It's unguided, and over long distances, it usually lost power. But at close range, very few navies had ships that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Imperial-class Star Destroyer in a broadside exchange. And in general, it's harder to shield and armor your ship from thermal energy weapons when compared to kinetic energy weapons. Another important weapon in the Imperial Arsenal was the Ion Cannon, or Ion Torpedo. 
These weapons spewed out high-speed ionized particles that wrecked havoc on enemy electrical systems and computer systems. An ion weapon could also take down a ship's shields and then disable their engines, life support, and weapons, leaving them virtually defenseless. While the Empire's enemies have routinely used ion weapons themselves against the Imperial fleet, the Galactic Empire also incorporated these weapons into their ships. Because ion weapons cause damage at the molecular level through its high-speed particles, it was almost impossible to properly shield equipment from it. Ion weapons also allowed the Galactic Empire to take out enemy forces with relatively low collateral damage. Now, despite what we see in the films, the Galactic Empire actually had some of the best pilots and officers in the entire galaxy. After the Clone Wars ended and the Jedi Order was wiped out, the Empire went through a process where it completely replaced its clone troopers with citizen soldiers. Imperial academies popped up across the galaxy and many different manufacturing industries and resources were nationalized. The government essentially created billions and billions of jobs overnight by increasing the size of the government and military. Eventually, local school systems were completely replaced by a galactic-wide system that eventually served as a pipeline for training Imperial pilots and officers. That meant that anyone with any talent or skill usually ended up in the Imperial Navy. For most people, especially outside the core regions of the galaxy, the best job they could wish for would be to be an officer in the Imperial Navy. While the overly competitive nature of these academies and officer corps sometimes led to destructive behavior, corruption, and infighting, it also produced some extremely deadly and capable officers. Most larger starships in the Galactic Empire Navy had refle most larger ships in the Galactic Empire Navy had deflector shields, and these were incredibly robust types of defenses. These usually were made up of three different types of deflectors. There was the navigational shield, which protected the ship from space debris and other flotsam floating in space. Then there was a shield that blocked thermal energy weapons like plasma bolts from a turbo laser. And lastly, a shield that stopped kinetic energy like proton torpedoes or a suicidal A-wing. This gave the Galactic Empire a layered shield system that was incredibly flexible and could counter many different types of munitions. This was especially useful when they were encountering aliens for the first time. Compared to some of the other factions we're going to be talking about in this series, the Galactic Empire's average ship was massive. The Imperial-class Star Destroyer was one of the most prolific capital ships in the Empire, and it was 1.6 kilometers long, and the Navy fielded over 25,000 of them across the galaxy. Now, against a small mobile fleet of rebels, the Star Destroyer might have some problems, but against another larger traditional fleet like the ones we are comparing the Empire to in the series, there are very few navies who can stand up to the sheer firepower and size of the Galactic Empire Navy. For some more primitive navies, a 1.6 kilometer long Star Destroyer would be easily the largest ship in their entire force. Another advantage with the Galactic Empire was the majority of their ships had a contingent of Space Marines on board, aka Stormtroopers. The Stormtrooper Corps was technically a separate branch of the military from the Navy, but worked hand in hand with these larger ships. The Stormtrooper Corps relied on the Imperial Navy for transport and lodging. In return, the Stormtrooper Corps could provide the Imperial Navy with capable ship security and very heavily armed ground teams. Larger ships like the Imperial Class Star Destroyer could hold an entire legion of Stormtroopers. Stormtroopers also specialized in breaching and taking over enemy ships, so in a pitched Navy battle, these onboard personnel provided an Imperial commander with some creative options. As an outsider, if you looked at the Galactic Empire, you'd realize that this was an organization that was ready for total war. By nationalizing so many different industries and resources, the Galactic Empire was able to lower production costs by huge amounts. In the short term, the nationalization of the entire military-industrial complex increased jobs in certain areas while destroying all other non-military related jobs. In general, poverty would increase as wages would decrease. The middle class saw their purchasing power slide drastically. But Palpatine's most brilliant move is probably replacing the clones with Imperial citizens. Because nothing starts a rebellion faster than having your civilian populace have high amounts of unemployment. I and mean, once your paycheck comes from the government and you're actively working for the military, you're much less likely to oppose it.
The military first policy of the Galactic Empire probably destroyed many social institutions and generally made life worse for everyone in the galaxy, but it also made the Empire an incredibly formidable fighting force. As long as the Empire is fighting some existential threats, you can expect the Imperial Navy to put up a crazy fight against the enemies. So guys, those are the 10 advantages with the Galactic Empire's Navy. Now it's time for you to vote in the poll. On a scale of 1 to 5, what do you rate the Galactic Empire 5 being the best? Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of this awesome series. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie, and you are the protagonist.